Today, football season starts. I mean, what can be better than grown men in um, uniforms beating each other up over a pigskin? I mean, there's nothing better. I remember two, three years ago when we used to do Sunday night services, a lot of you guys would come in depressed because, I mean, you guys are Cowboys fans, but um, now you guys can come to church happy, go home and then get depressed. And so it's a completely different environment. But if you're a football fan like I am, if you remember last year, the beginning of the season, uh, the refs were in a dispute with the owners and um, the refs were on strike for several weeks. So for three weeks of the season, in the beginning of last year, um, they had replacement refs. Um, and these replacement guys were play, um, uh, officiating the game. Um, these guys um, got a lot of bad rap. I mean, they made some bad calls. They, I mean, they weren't, um, they weren't really, really that good at refing. Um, and it's kind of sad because these guys were treated like they had no idea what they were doing. And maybe they didn't know as much as the regular referees, but the fact is not, these guys weren't like worship pastors from local churches and their worship band that the NFL picked up to officiate a game, right? These guys were, sorry, Benno, but um, uh, these guys were um, refs who refed at a college level or um, high school football, but they never did it at a professional level. Um, so if you think about it, if we never knew that real refs existed, if we never had an idea that there were actually really good professional refs, and all we ever saw was a replacement ref, we would have thought that this was the way the game was played. We would have thought this is the way officiating was done, that officials always made mistakes, and we would have never bickered or complained. But the reality is, because we knew that there was something better, because we have seen something better, and now we were seeing something inferior, um, we began to bicker, we began to complain. And so here we are at the beginning of this new season, the real refs start right from the beginning of the season, and I guarantee you tomorrow, for those of you who are like me, and now for the next 16 weeks, um, KLTY and KCBI and Disney Radio will not be playing on my car, but it's gonna be ESPN so I can get all the scoop from every team. I'll guarantee you that no commentator is gonna say, I wish we had the replacement refs back, right? None of them are gonna say that because we've seen the inferior, we've seen the superior, and the superior is so much better than what's inferior. That's what Hebrews 7 is all about. That's the message of Hebrews 7. I'm hoping that illustration will help you because this chapter is incredibly difficult. It's a very challenging passage. I tried to skip it because I knew we haven't done it in a while, but then I looked at chapter 8 and realized we can't do chapter 8 unless you knew chapter 7, and then I was like, crap, this sucks. I've got to do chapter 7. So, um, so we're going to look at a chapter, and it's going to be confusing because there's some stuff in here that you guys are very unfamiliar with. So I'm going to do a lot of explaining this morning and hopefully put all of this together, and somehow at the end you can say, I'm so glad I came this morning instead of sleeping in. Hopefully that will work out. But there's a lot of stuff in here this morning that we're going to work through the entire chapter. So some of you guys that are here that come consistently, this is going to be a little different from what we normally do. Normally I'll give you three points or four points, but here we're going to work through the entire passage. Those of you who are new, we're just going to work through this big chunk of passage, 28 verses, and see what God is trying to teach us. It's been a while, so let me quickly recap. Hebrews 2, we start by hearing that Jesus is a high priest. He's a high priest, and that's just an introduction to the concept. Then in chapter 3, the author of Hebrews says it again, Jesus is our high priest. In chapter 4, it's developed a little bit more, the idea that Jesus is a priest on our behalf. In chapter 5, we're introduced to this idea that Jesus is a high priest in the order of this guy named Melchizedek. He doesn't play football. He's just got a guy that has a weird name. Um, we're introduced to this guy. We aren't told anything about him in chapter 5 except that Jesus is a high priest in his order. Chapter 6, the guy goes onto a tangent and um, gives the church some warnings and tells them what not to do and tells them to wake up, stop being um, lazy, stop being um, slothful, but grow in Jesus. And then at the end of chapter 6, he again says, Jesus is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So we have this concept building up from the very beginning of Hebrews all the way to chapter 6. Jesus is the Son of God through whom which God spoke. He's also a high priest, which is really important for us, but he's also a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So now we are at the place where we have to ask the question, who is this guy? 
Why is he important? What difference does he make? And Hebrews chapter 7, we read the teaching, the unfolding of what all of this means. All of us in here know something about priests, right? Maybe you grew up Catholic or you grew up Eastern Orthodox and you're familiar with priests, or maybe you have friends that are Catholic or Eastern Orthodox and you know what um, priests do. Maybe you grew up hearing about religious priests in other religions, maybe a Hindu priest or something like that, or maybe the only thing that you know about a priest is what you've learned in the Old Testament, what the Jewish priests would do. But everyone in here has an idea what a priest does. Typically, a priest is a guy in a religious system that helps people deal with the problem of sin in their lives. That's typically what a priest does. He addresses the issue of sin in the lives of the people. And what I want to do this morning, before we dive into Hebrews 7, is I want to look at the Old Testament and how the priests functioned in the Old Testament and what God prescribed for the priest to do. In the Old Testament, God installs the priesthood from one family. You've got the entire nation of Israel. You guys, if you grow up in church, you know the story. There's 12 tribes, and out of the 12 tribes, one tribe has been chosen to serve as priests. They're called the Levites. They were designed by God through the law to be the priests for the rest of the nation. The Levites were to function for the people as priests to help them deal with the problem of sin. That was their job. That was what they were supposed to do by God's directive, deal with the problem of sin so that the people of Israel could, have, could experience God in a way that they did not deserve. So they didn't have to experience the God the way they should have deserved, right? I mean, they were sinful people. They should have been condemned. But because the priests were there, they could actually experience God in a way that they didn't deserve at all. So the priests were commissioned by God, by the law, to offer certain sacrifices that would make atonement for sin so that the people could experience something about relating to God that was beyond what they deserved. They didn't deserve good treatment at all from God. Because, but because the high priest and the priest helped them deal with their sin, they could experience God in such a way that was way beyond what they ever deserved. So you got the Levites who served the people. But among the Levites, there was this one guy that was chosen to be the high priest. He was the chief guy. He was the main guy. And the high priest, every year, on one day of the year, would go into the Holy of Holies and make atonement for the people of Israel. It was called the Day of Atonement. Once a year, and it was a huge ritual for the people. This set them straight for the entire year before God. So the high priest, what he would do is he would take a bull... He would sacrifice the bull for himself, for his own sins, because he was a sinful guy. He messed up. He screwed up. He had sins in his life. So he would offer the sacrifice of a bull for his own sins, because if he went into the Holy of Holies without atoning for his own sins, he would die. God's holiness would wipe him out. So he begins by offering a sacrifice for himself. Then he would offer a sacrifice of a goat for the sins of the people called a um, sin offering. Then he would take another goat called a scapegoat. He'd put his hands on top of the goat. I know this all sounds weird to us, but um, and he would pronounce on the goat the sins of the people. And then a designated guy would take that goat, take it outside of the city, and release it to its death. So there's a lot more things that are involved in the ceremony, but that kind of gives you an idea of what the Day of Atonement, what the priest and the high priest were supposed to do. This happened every year so that the people could experience God in a way that they did not deserve. Even though they were sinful, even though they did not have any right to the presence of God, because sacrifices were made, they can go and worship God and experience God in a way that they didn't deserve. But here's the problem. The problem was this needed to happen every year. It needed to happen on a continual basis. Every single year, They had to do the same thing because the remedy for sin wasn't permanent. It was temporary. And the blood of bulls and goats could never permanently deal with the problem of sin in our lives. So the whole system of the Levites was really designed to point out that the fact is that there is something better. But if you grew up a Hebrew or a Jew, all you really knew was the Levitical system of the priesthood by the law of God, designed by God, then your perception of that system would be that this is what God designed to deal with the problem of sin. 
It would be kind of like if we never knew about the real refs and if it was all we saw was the replacement refs, let's say they could never come to agreement and for two or three or four years, all we got was replacement refs. And then one day, one of us decided to look at the archives, the NFL archives, and we're watching the quality of the officiating. We go and we say, oh my goodness, these refs back in 2011 or 2010, they knew what they were doing. They never made that many mistakes. There was actually something good back then. It doesn't have to be this bad that we, they could go and say, listen, guys, you guys are dealing with replacement refs, but the reality is there are professional refs that used to do this. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, listen, guys, I've gone through the archives. I've gone through the Bible. I've gone through the Old Testament. And there is something better than what we're doing. There's actually something better than the Levitical priesthood. And it's wrapped up in a guy by the name of Melchizedek. So back in Genesis 14, now let me tell you a little bit about this guy, Melchizedek. There's three verses about him. That's all there is in the Old Testament about this guy. Three verses, Genesis 14. And the story is not really about him. It's about a guy named Abraham. You guys are familiar with him. Abraham is living in an area where kings would reign over certain territories and places. And he lived in an area where there were nine kings. So nine kings would live in this area and reign over certain area, this territory. Four of these kings decided to form an alliance and go on a rampage and wipe everyone else out. These other five kings, realizing that if they didn't form an alliance, they would eventually be wiped out. So the five kings form a new alliance. So now you got the four king army versus the five king army. Yes, it's super confusing. So what happens is the four king army wipes out the five king army. One of the kings in the five king army is the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, and that's important. And so what happens is the four king army goes into Sodom and Gomorrah, and because they've won the battle, they take all of the people, they take all of the stuff, they take all of the children, they take all anything that's worthwhile taking, and they carry it off as plunder or spoils of their victory. The reason Sodom and Gomorrah is important is because in Sodom and Gomorrah was a guy by the name of Lot. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. And so Lot, his family, his possessions, all of that has been captured, and they're being taken away by this four king army. And they don't know what's going to happen to them. They could be murdered. They could be um, made slaves forever. And that's what's going on. And one escapee escapes, runs to Abraham and says, listen, Lot has been captured. He's been taken. His family has been taken. All of his stuff has been taken. And so Abraham looks around, finds 318 people in his family. It's a big family. So 318 people in his family group that he has personally raised, he has personally trained for battle, and he takes these 318 people, and they go out against the four king army, and they destroy them. They wipe them out, and now they've won the victory. See, Abraham received some promises from God. I will curse those who curse you. I will bless those who bless you. Abraham wasn't a man you messed with, because God was on the side of Abraham. So Abraham chases down the four king army, completely wipes him out. He gets Lot, his family, his stuff back. And as he's going back home, he's going through the valley of the kings, and he's making his way with all of his spoils, all of the stuff that he's recaptured. He's making his way back. And think about it. Abraham's the man here. You've got nine kings. Four of them beat five of them. And Abraham by himself beat four of them. Yes, that's confusing. But Abraham is a man that no one wanted to mess with. He was the one on top. He was the chief guy. So he's walking through the valley of the king, and this guy shows up who's another king, but he wasn't involved in the battle at all. He comes out to Abraham. He meets him in the valley. This man, the king of Salem, captures the attention of Abraham. And Abraham, in response to this king, gives the king a tenth of all of his spoils. He basically gives him a tithe. And now, this king of Salem named Melchizedek blesses Abraham. That's all we know about the guy. That's, but Hebrews 7 is all about him. Here's what we know. He meets Abraham. He blesses Abraham. Abraham gives him 10%. That's all we know. He's a king of Salem. He's the priest of the Most High God. 
And the author of Hebrew picks up on that as the foundation of where he's going to go in Hebrews chapter 7 in explaining Melchizedek and his position in the book. With that, turn with me to Hebrews 7. That's a long introduction. Hebrews 7. What I want to do is I want to go verse by verse, and we'll stop, and we'll explain all of this, and then come back at the end of it. So read with me at verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blesses him. And to Abraham, God, and to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth of everything. He is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he's also king of Salem, that is king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the son of God, he continues a priest forever. The author of Hebrews is telling us that Melchizedek is pointing to some, something better. He's saying, listen, you guys are dealing with like replacement um, priests. There's actually a priest that's better. And this is how he does it. He sees these three verses in Genesis 14, but he also sees a verse in Psalm 110 where David prophetically says about Jesus that you're going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he brings all of it together. He says, you're going to be a priest in the order of Melchizedek. So David prophetically says that a priest is coming that is so much better than what we have right now. And the author of Hebrews picks up on this and on what David says and what's in Genesis. And he communicates to us that Melchizedek is a discovery, the revelation of God, that something better is possible. Something better is out there, what you have right now in the Levitical priesthood, what you have right now in making sacrifices all the time, what you have right now in temporary relief from your sin, listen, there's something that's inferior to what is out there. There is actually something better. And the reality, the possibility that something superior exists is found in and through this guy named Melchizedek. See, Meshizedek in this character in Genesis, we only get three things about him. But in Hebrews, the writer actually says some more things that we didn't know before. He says he doesn't have a father. He doesn't have a mother. He's the king of Salem. Basically, Salem is, comes from the word shalom, which means peace. He is the king of righteousness. He has no genealogy. All of this stuff that we're learning about him. And you've got to understand that when you get to this portion that he's using Melchizedek as a figure, figurative way to point out that something is literally better. When we think about Melchizedek and what we have in Scripture, this, all we get is he appeared, he blesses Abraham, Abraham gives him 10%, there's no genealogical record, there's no listing about who his father is, who his mother is, there's no mention about his upbringing, his past, his present, his future, none of that is mentioned. It just talks about his brief experience with Abraham. Abraham gives him a gift, he blesses Abraham, he's gone. There's nothing else there is in the Bible about this guy. And then he pops up again in Psalms 110, and all of a sudden he pops up everywhere in the book of Hebrews. So the author of Hebrews is saying the way that Melchizedek is presented in the Old Testament as if he has no father, no mother, there's no history about him. The reason that is so important is because when you look at the Levitical priesthood, when you look at the priesthood in the Old Testament, the only way that you can be a priest is because if you were a part of the family of the Levites. So your dad was a priest, And if your dad was a priest, then you would become a priest. That was your call in life. So the only way that you can ever become a priest was if you could be born in their family. God said that the Levites would be a priest, so son after son, generation after generation, all of them would be priests. So you're a priest because of where you were born, not because of what you wanted to do. It was because you were descended from another priest, kind of like the royal family. They're make a big deal about them all the time, but kind of very similar to the Levites. So now, but that's not how Melchizedek became a priest. He is presented as if he has no beginning, no end, and he represents figuratively that a perpetual priesthood. He's, again, Melchizedek is pointing out, listen, guys, there's something better. And what the author wants us to see is that Melchizedek is actually superior to Abraham that he's actually someone that represents the order of the priesthood that is better than the order that the Levites have, than what Israel has. So he's going to unpack that even further. Look, go with me to verse 4. Verse 4. See how great this man was to whom 
Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils, and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their own brothers. Through these also are descended from Abraham. So the Levites are commanded by God through the law to collect a tithe. To basically, that's what they're supposed to live on. You're supposed to live off 10% of what everyone else makes. So the people make sure that the Levites are taken care of. That's what the Levites were supposed to do as priests. Go to verse 6. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. It is beyond dispute that the inferior has been blessed by the superior. He's establishing here the fact that Abraham gave a tithe to Melchizedek before the law said you were supposed to give tithes. And because he blesses Abraham, the writer uses that to prove that Melchizedek is better than Abraham. And there's a reason he wants to prove that. Go to the next verse, verse 8. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, he actually paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. So now he says, look, Melchizedek is greater than Abraham, and here's the connection, here's why. From Abraham comes the Levites. Levites were generations down from Abraham. And what happens is that the Levitical priests who were supposed to receive the tithes actually end up giving tithes through Abraham to Melchizedek. Again, proving that the priesthood of Melchizedek is so much superior, so much better than the priest of the Levites. The Melchizedek is superior, Levites inferior. And he points out that there is something that existed, something that is existing, something that is there, and it's pointing to something that is so much better. And he continues, and he just basically rips the Levites here, continues to talk about how inferior they are. Verse 11, now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek rather than one named after the order of Aaron? See, if Levitical priesthood could do it, if they could take care of our sins, if they could remedy sin permanently for us, if we didn't have to make any more sacrifices, this would have been great. But because of the order of Melchizedek was there in Scripture, it pointed out prophetically by David, it said that, listen, there's something so much better than what the Levites are offering. The fact that the Levitical priesthood could not do it, and the fact that every single year they had to keep making these sacrifices, every single year they had to keep coming and offering animals so that their sins could be forgiven, meant that there is no permanent remedy for our sin problem. There is no permanent solution for us to address how messed up we are. And because of that, we need something better. Let's keep going. Verse 12. For when there is a change of the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. So we need a new priest. That means the law has to be changed because the law created the Levitical priesthood. Verse 13, For the one of whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has served at the altar. Verse 13 is where you begin this transition. Up to verse 13, it's like this royal rumble, those of you wrestling fans. It's Melchizedek, it's the Levites, it's Abraham, and Melchizedek wins out. He, the writer of Hebrews says he's better than Abraham, he's better than the Levites, he's the champion. He gets the belt, he gets to go home, he gets to brag for a little while. And now we're transitioning our focus. And instead of focusing on the priest and Abraham, we're now focusing on who Jesus is. And how, what we're going to see is that through the order of Melchizedek, that Jesus is the perfect answer to our problem of sin. So we transition in verse 13 to something better. Look at verse 14. Can you put that up, verse 14? For it's evident that our Lord has descended from Judah and connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about the priests. So here's the story. Moses gives the law. He says the priests come from the Levites, right? That's the only way that priests can come. It's only through this family. He said nothing in that law about the tribe of Judah. So if a priest comes from the tribe of Judah... That means the law has to be changed. The law says priests only come through Levites. So if there's a different 
priest that's going to come from another tribe, the law has got to be completely changed. Next verse. This becomes more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. He's going to say that it becomes more of evident the change of the law, the change of the new priesthood. It's going to be more evident that someone emerges as a priest that has an indestructible life, whose life can't be destroyed. And we know the testimony of Jesus. They killed him. They murdered him. He was buried, but he resurrected, and he lives forever. It is by virtue of his indestructible life that is being displayed the reality that he is so much better than what the priest offered. He is superior. He's the one that Melchizedek is pointing to. He's superior than the Levitical priesthood. He's superior to Melchizedek. He is one of a kind. And the next verse is prophetic about Jesus. It says, For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Here's a statement from Psalm 110 that says, Jesus is better than anything else. Next verse. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness, for the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. So on the one hand, we have the old law, and the old law was established in the Levitical priesthood. The Levitical priesthood gave you opportunity for you to experience something that you did not deserve in a relationship with God. But... It was a temporary answer. Every year, you had to keep redoing the same thing. But that was inferior to what, because every year, animals had to die. You can never get super close to God. The high priest got the closest. Once a year, he could go into the Holy of Holies and be in the presence of God. But even then, that was a scary thing for him because if a high priest went in with sin in his life, he would fall over dead in the presence of God. So even that wasn't like, sweet, I get to go into God's presence. It's I'm scared out of my mind when I'm going into God's presence. See, the former law was weak. It was useless in that it could never perfectly take away our sins. So the new ways that have been established in Jesus, with him now being our high priest, so now we can have better hope, a hope through which all of us can actually draw near to God. The old law helps us see how hard it is for us to come to God. But the new law says you can actually draw near to Him. It reveals, the old law reveals the need for something better. The new law, the new priesthood, gives us an opportunity to draw near to God personally, to experience the presence of God as a loving Father, unlike any high priest in the Levitical system could ever do. You didn't have to be born a priest. You get to draw near to God on the basis of Jesus. Look at the next verse. For it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever. All the Levitical priests became priests because of the law which says you're going to be a high priest and you, there's nothing you can do about it. If your dad was a priest, you're going to be a priest. That's what the law said. But Jesus becomes a priest by an oath of God. God makes an oath. And the essence of that oath is this. It's connected to the eternal presence, eternal nature of Jesus. So there's no one coming after him and there was no one that was before him that is like him. He's one of a kind. He's unique. He is superior. He is so much greater. He's better than any other priest that has ever been. He's better than any other prophet or Messiah that will come after him. And he has been sworn by the Father. Listen, you are going to be the priest forever. Look at verse 22. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The covenant that Jesus is offering is better than the former covenant under the Levites, not because of what Jesus does for us on a continual basis, but because of Je who Jesus is. We have a better covenant because we have a great high priest in Jesus. Everything that makes this better is strictly because Jesus is so much better. 
He's superior. Verse 23. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds the priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Because Jesus is a high priest, he never changes. He's got this position by the oath of his father, by virtue of who he is. Because he's a high priest forever, go to verse 25. Here's where it gets really good. Consequently, he is able to save to the other most, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He has no needs like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once and for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weaknesses as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later than the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Here's where it gets really good, and here's what all of this means. Because Jesus is a high priest in the order of Melchizedek, superior we can through him draw near to God. You and I, who do not deserve to draw near to God, can experience drawing near to God the very thing we don't deserve. As long as we draw near through Jesus. See, Jesus is the one who is our intercessor. He is perfectly suited to be our intercessor. Here's why. Because Jesus is holy. We're not holy. Because Jesus is undefiled. We're defiled. Because Jesus is innocent. There isn't a person in this room, if you're honest, would say that you are innocent and you deserve God's goodness. He is separated from sinners. He is exalted above the heavens. He is where our souls long to be. And He is interceding for us on behalf of the, on behalf of the Father for us. And He is doing it in this and forever. Here's what this means. It's not that just Jesus is praying for us. That's one thing that He's doing. He is interceding on our behalf. No question about it. He speaks words to the Father on our behalf. And if we've embraced Christ, if you know Jesus this morning, He is speaking words of favor and blessing over you to the Father. But listen, it's more than that. It's so much more than what Jesus is saying to the Father about you. Jesus is the one that's standing between us and the Father. So that when we are saved from the wrath of God, it is because Jesus is standing in between So that when God looks at us, he sees us through Jesus. When God looks, he sees Jesus first. Hold on. There we go. So we're saved from the brokenness of sin. We're saved from the sorrow of sin. We're saved from the grip of sin. We're saved from the disease of sin. We're saved from everything that is destroying the life that God has intended for us. We are saved completely through Jesus because Jesus stands between us and the Father so that when the Father sees us, He is seeing us through Jesus. He intercedes for us so that He is completely able to save us. And that is why we draw near to Him. See, if we were in the old system, if we were under the old priesthood, none of us could ever get close to God. None of us could ever draw near to Him. None of us could ever call Him Abba, Father. We would be experiencing a relationship with God that was nice, but it was at a distance. We would come to Him in fear and reverence, and we still do, but we also come to Him as a loving Father who takes care of us, who loves us, who provides for us. See, but when we see Melchizedek, and through Melchizedek, we see Jesus, we'll be crying out, listen, there is something so much better than offering sacrifices for our sins. And Jesus comes in, and every one of us now can enter into the holy of holies, can enter into the presence of God, can feel God's grace and presence in our lives. In fact, it's not that we enter into the presence of God alone, but now because of Jesus, God comes and lives inside of us. Melchizedek points that Jesus is something so much better than what we could ever have. I don't want to hear any comments from you 
iPhone users. Um, I own a Samsung Galaxy S3, and in my humble and com honest opinion, this is the best phone out there. Um, I love this phone. I do so much on it. But when I bought the phone, I made sure I got insurance on it. I wanted to make sure that I was covered in case something happened, right? I've got three little kids. I've had instances before when one of them decided to suck on the phone and um, saliva went in and destroyed the phone or I've dropped it. So the insurance basically is a promise that if anything ever happens to the phone, all I have to do is pay a small deductible and Sprint will send me a brand new phone. So a couple weeks ago, I swear sometimes God does stuff to me just so I could use a sermon illustration. Um, but a couple weeks ago, I woke up one morning and my phone doesn't work. It makes no sense. The night before it was working, in the morning it wouldn't turn on. And I'm hanging out with Rennie and Jensen and Ben, and they're just mocking me because they're all iPhone users and their phones were working. Um, but it wasn't like my baby sucked on it. It wasn't like I dropped it, nothing. It wouldn't turn on. It was charged all night. It wouldn't turn on. I had insurance. So I called the insurance company and said, listen, you promised me, I didn't say this literally, you promised me that if my phone doesn't work, I pay a deductible and you're going to ship me a new phone. Within 24 hours, a brand new phone was sitting at my doorsteps. Listen, Sprint didn't send me a phone because I'm the one that uses the most minutes and the fact that I didn't have a phone means that Sprint is losing money for me. That's not why they sent me a phone. They didn't send me a phone because for some reason or another, I buy 500 phones at a time, and um, I'm one guy who bought one phone from one store. Sprint didn't send me a phone because I'm a valued customer at all. Sprint sent me a phone because they made a promise. They made a promise that if anything ever happened to my phone, they would replace it. Listen, this morning, you and I, we're broken. We are completely and totally broken. God made us. We broke ourselves. You ever feel that you couldn't draw near to God because you sensed your own sin and your brokenness? Feel like you couldn't go to Him at all? Maybe you felt like if you really tried to draw near to God, that you're afraid because what you're going to experience is God's wrath and anger. Maybe you felt like you were outside of the time frame where God gave you an opportunity to come, but you didn't come at that time, so now you no longer qualify, that you're no longer able to cash in on God. You ever feel like you're so far from God that it seems impossible for you to draw near to Him? See, the reality is, the truth is that every one of us, you and I, have felt like that at times in our lives. But Scripture, Hebrews 7, reminds us that we have a promise that is unparalleled to any other promise and a guarantee that surpasses any other guarantee that the world offers. God has promised to save you and save me completely if we come to Him, if we draw near to Him through Jesus. That's the promise and the guarantee that he will go through on his promise is that Jesus Christ gave himself up for you once and for all. Jesus Christ, when he gave himself up for you once and for all, is so much far superior to anything else that has ever happened in the history of humanity. His once and for all sacrifice for your sin and my sin has paid for all of our sins, past, present, and future. He died once for all of it. He didn't have to keep coming back and dying over and over and over. He did it once so that we could be forgiven once and for all. It is done. Jesus is the guarantee that God will come through on his promise to save you completely. See, the question is, do you believe the promise of God in your life? Are you willing to cash in on the guarantee? Do you recognize that if you come to God, if you draw near to him through Jesus, that you're not going to get the treatment that you deserve you're going to get the treatment that only Jesus deserved. He's your intercessor. So instead of getting what your sins deserved, if you try to draw near to God through Jesus, you're going to get what is only reserved for Jesus. See, the relationship that the Father has with the Son 
is the relationship that Jesus offers to you if you will draw near the draw to the Father through Jesus. The honor that Jesus receives from the Father is the honor that is reserved for you if you draw near to God through Jesus. The position of closeness and intimacy with the Father that is reserved only for the Son is the position of closeness and intimacy that is given to you if you draw near to God through Jesus. He's giving it to you because he paid the price for him to extend it to you so that now you and I, through faith in Jesus, are what the Bible says, co-heirs with Jesus. We're sharing all of his blessings so that the Father interacts with us the way the Father act, would interact with the Son. We get to draw near to God because Jesus is our high priest. And guys, there is nothing else like it. I've got a friend who does, he races a lot, runs a lot, and he also plays tennis a lot. About two years ago, he bought these pair of shoes from Nike, tennis shoes, for about $130. And the unique thing about these shoes was that Nike offered a promise to him that if you wear these shoes out completely through normal wear in six months, all you have to do is put these shoes in a box, ship it to Nike, and Nike will send you a new pair of shoes. So within four months of running and um, tennis, his shoes were completely worn out. So knowing that Nike had made a promise, he took his shoes that were worn out and beat up, put them in a box, shipped them to Nike. Nike immediately returned a new pair of shoes to him. And the promise that was applied for the first shoe was also there for the second shoe. And so within four to five months, he wore out his second pair of shoes. He didn't even pay for the second pair of shoes. Wore it out, remembered the promise, put it in a box, shipped it to Nike. Nike gave him a new pair of shoes. He told me this has been going on for a year and a half. So every four or five months, he gets a new pair of shoes from Nike without paying for it. What a stupid promise from Nike, right? I mean, it makes no sense. But you would think after two or three times, Nike would send him a letter saying, listen, you maxed out on the guarantee that you can't do it anymore. So far, no letter has come. He's continuing to wear his shoes and wear them out and get new ones every three, four months. Maybe this morning, you keep coming to God with the same old sin, the same old story. And maybe you feel like God has every reason to say to you, listen, that's one too many times. You keep coming back with the same thing over and over and over again. How are you going to grow up? Maybe you feel like God is saying you maxed out the guarantee because you keep doing the same thing over and over. But can I encourage you this morning? That will never happen as long as Jesus is your high priest. As long as Jesus is the one who is interceding for you. See, he's made an eternal promise so that every time you draw near to God through Jesus, you can find the guarantee of Christ giving his life for you so that your sins are paid for, past, present, and future. And you can find that what you do not deserve, intimacy with the Father, love of the Father, relationship with God, you will receive because Jesus took your place. So let me encourage you this morning as we close, draw near to God. Keep drawing near to God. Never stop drawing near to God. No matter where you are in your life, no matter what you're going through, no matter how hard it is, no matter how many times you failed, the guarantee is no matter how often you come, He'll forgive you. He will be there for you. See, it's not about you because the promise is the guarantee of Jesus. It's His reputation that's on stake because he promised that you can draw near to him anytime this morning you're here this morning maybe you feel like you've maxed out and the invitation for you this morning
morning is draw near to God. Draw near to Him. Maybe this morning you feel like life is good and you're doing it on your own. But you're getting burned out. The invitation for you is draw near to God. Stop, keep drawing near to God. Never stop giving up on drawing near to God. All of us need to be reminded of this. It doesn't matter if you're caught up in a mess of sin or if you're just kind of have life going well right now. We get to go to God in a way that is so much better than what we could have ever deserved or ever imagined. And the only reason that's possible is because we have a great high priest named Jesus. A great high priest named Jesus. In a few moments, we're going to come to the table and celebrate communion. Everything we talked about this morning is connected to what that table symbolizes. Because what that table symbolizes is Jesus living the life that we should have lived, dying the death that we should have died, so that we could receive the blessings that we do not deserve. So I'm going to ask you to examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections, your desires. If there's anything in your life that is not from God, would you go to the throne of grace this morning? Would you draw near to God? He's waiting for you. He is welcoming you. He's ready to forgive ready to transform, ready to make you new. The way we do communion here at Loft is that when you have prayed, when you have examined your own life, you are welcome to come and grab the elements from the table and come back to your seats. And at the end, we will partake of it together. But examine your heart, your attitudes, your affections. And when you're ready, I invite you to come and grab the elements. Father, this morning, thank you that you give us something that is so much better than what was there before. Thank you that we don't have to come to you based on our goodness or our sacrifices of things that we do or whatever. Thank you that we can come to you because of Jesus. Thank you that we have such a great high priest who loves us more than we could ever imagine, more than we would deserve. This morning, we give you our lives and say, have your way with us. In Jesus' name.